So I guess we've established that Edmonton is really in a good position from the perspective of biodiversity, in part because of our wonderful river valley, our ravines, our parks. What issues, though, might we have? We're in a good position in some respects. We do have this core of natural areas that's really high quality in many cases. Some of this habitat is still quite intact. For example, White Mud Ravine. But we are not doing so well in the periphery of the city and really anywhere outside of the river valley and ravine system. Only 2.3% of the protected areas in Edmonton are found outside of that river valley and ravine in what planners call the tablelands, the upland areas. Those are also really important and particularly if we're going to maintain the connectivity of biodiversity from the river valley into the tablelands of Edmonton and into the natural areas beyond, it's really important that we keep the natural areas that remain. They're being lost fast, in fact. They're being lost more quickly than they're being protected. So I would say one of the really urgent things for our future as a city is to secure the protection of our remaining quality natural areas in the uplands. And to try to make that as continuous as possible, is that part of what you're saying? Yes, very much so. If we can plan new neighborhoods, for example, in such a way that they provide core pieces of habitat large enough for populations to exist, at least for a short period of time, or for individuals to live out their lives that could be connected to other small populations via the dispersal of individuals, and those individuals can even be plant seeds, then we can hope to keep this sort of functioning network of protected areas or just spots that contain biodiversity. Those spots can be really tiny. They can be a nature scape that's um, 100 meters by 50 meters, such as the one at the school where my kids go. They could be a naturalized yard of somebody's residence. They could be um, a boulevard between a major artery and a residential neighborhood that's been planted with native trees instead of introduced ones, a policy the city is beginning to adopt. So these natural areas, as I'm calling them, may not be a provincial park or a city park even. All they need to be able to provide all of these benefits of biodiversity that I've been speaking of is to contain native species that are connected functionally to other places that contain those species. I want to back up a little bit. You painted us a picture of what a continent, an entire continent, can look like when biodiversity perhaps isn't respected to the extent that it should be. What would an urban environment look like if biodiversity isn't what it needs to be? Mm, how bad could an urban environment look? That's kind of your question. It could look pretty bad. We see lots of examples of cities and we see parts of our own city that are really almost without biodiversity. So when we look at a parking lot surrounded by buildings, we can see that as biodiversity poor. It's depauperate. When we look at um, a mowed lawn, including some city parks with mowed lawns, maybe ringed by some introduced tree species, we might see nature and, and feel the aesthetic benefits of biodiversity. And those aren't trivial, but we are not going to be able to enjoy many of the other kinds of benefits of biodiversity, particularly this contribution to this functional ecological system. If we were uh, to gradually replace those kinds of areas or augment those kinds of areas with more natural landscapes, we could enjoy all of the benefits of biodiversity, the ecosystem services, as well as the retention of all of these species, keeping the parts, as well as the aesthetic benefits that we enjoy. In fact, one of the fastest growing pastimes in, in North America is bird watching. And one of the most important things to retain a diversity of birds is to retain a diversity of plants, particularly shrubs and understory. So when we mow everything down under the trees in an urban park, for example, or in our yard, uh, we might get a, a situation that looks nice in, in some sort of Victorian sense of green spaces. But we're going to lose the opportunity to attract to that space the beautiful butterflies that we might otherwise attract, uh, the beautiful birds we might otherwise attract, and lose a little bit of that aesthetic recreational enjoyment on top of those ecosystem services. Okay, so what else can we do as residents, as perhaps homeowners, to encourage biodiversity in the areas that, where we have some influence? Mm. 
Luckily, we can do a lot as individuals to influence the biodiversity in our city, more so than we can do as individuals to inter influence the biodiversity in our country or on our continent. Really, uh, all of the things that are, our kids are being taught in schools add up and matter. Water conservation does support biodiversity. Avoiding the use of pesticides and herbicides absolutely enhances biodiversity. At first, in ways you can't see, some insects you didn't know were there. But they're the insects that are eaten by the birds you'd really like to see in your yard. Other things that we can do that are uh, maybe more tangible in the support of biodiversity are really to support natural vegetation at every opportunity. Whether it's uh, some pocket park in your neighborhood, whether it's your own yard, whether it's what you prefer be retained in your dog park. Should the city mow that down or should they leave those grasslands there? There's a little grassland over in Mill Creek that has a clay-colored sparrow every spring and it's a tiny little patch and clay-colored sparrows are not common in, in Edmonton or any city. They need natural prairie-like habitat. But just that little patch of sort of degraded grass is enough for that clay-colored sparrow and it's kind of neat to find it there. So part of what you're saying then is respect nature and the way nature would want that plot of land to be in this place where we live? That is part of what I'm saying, Marvin, but I don't want to say it with too much strictness or inflexibility. One doesn't have to turn their entire yard into a, a nature scape or a native prairie to be able to contribute to biodiversity. You probably don't want to let it overgrow <laughs> with weeds either. You probably don't want to. In I mean, fact, just because you, that's natural. If you just let it go, it will be the introduced weeds that take over as opposed to uh, native prairie. But really, just planting one species bee bomb designed to attract pollinators is making a contribution. Choosing uh, not to uh, use pesticide or even fertilizer because of the effects that has on our water system can make uh, a, a, a significant, if difficult to measure, contribution. And really the biggest uh, effect probably is on each other. As, as there are more and more people who value natural biodiversity, native species, it will become easier and easier to support those species, to find them, to propagate them, to enjoy them, and less, there will be less and less societal pressure to do away with those things. Manicured parks, for example. Some of our work shows that uh, manicured parks where the grass is mowed have very few small mammal species and very few individuals. If that grass is allowed to grow up a little bit, suddenly, from nowhere, seemingly, these other species come in. Species like meadow voles, which absolutely cannot live in mowed grass, but they're quite happy in uh, a more natural grassland, even if it doesn't have only native species in it, even if it has quite a few introduced species. And those meadow voles, in turn, are food for owls and coyotes, creating uh, a sort of spiral up effect of these small actions, seemingly easy or insignificant for individuals to make.